today on a bench we have a unit in Madison. Now this is the last version of it, so it has a digital clock built into it. A uh, customer sent this one in to, he just purchased it, and he's really not sure about its operating condition. He just wanted to send, you know, once he got it, wanted to send it to me and have it redone. Um, and redone means just give it a basic check over, see what it needs. Uh, he wants the electrolytic capacitor is replaced. And then we'll fault find if there's any faults. So I haven't done anything to it yet other than remove the top cover and the bottom cover. So I think I'm going to make this video a uh, what to do when you get an unknown radio. <clears throat> so unknown meaning it's new to you. You really honestly don't know its operating condition. Uh, and honestly, in most cases, uh, don't take the person's word that you bought it from. Somebody may tell you, oh, it's a fantastic working radio, no problems. Now, if it's an AM, FM radio, or a stereo, or television, something like that, even a computer or whatever, yeah, I might take a person at their word. CB radios are an exception. CB radios are known for being hacked at, butchered, <laughs> slaughtered, destroyed, uh, I have seen some absolute horror shows come across my bench. So, a few things to do to a radio before you power it up. Uh, I really can't state, state this enough. You should never just get a radio and plug it in. Unless you just got it back from a tech. You know, it's you bought a radio from a tech or from a repu reputable dealer or something. But, you know, if you just purchased it on eBay at a flea market, at public auction, wherever. You've got it in your local, you know, for sale ads or something. Don't plug it in. First thing you should do, remove the top and bottom covers. Because you want to inspect it and see what butchery might have been done to it over the years. Uh, now, I've already looked at this one a little bit, and I can see it really doesn't look like it's ever had anything done other than a nice, thick deposit of dust inside. So it has the protective dirt. <laughs> Um, which will get cleaned out. But at first appearance, you know, first thing, just to look at it, does it look like it was halfway well-maintained? If the radio is in good condition, then there's a good chance at least the person that had it took care of it. Um, you know, if every knob is obviously different, there's huge gouges, it looks like it's been dropped you know, off the edge of the Empire State Building, yeah, you might just want to run away from those to start with. But this one, in obviously in very good cosmetic condition to start with, uh, so that's always a, a good a good sign. Uh, now, the next thing I always recommend, and you definitely want to do this before you ever power anything up, and, and honestly, it's not just CVs. Before you power anything up that plugs into a wall, always, always, always check the fuse, especially in CV radios. People are known for putting in monster-sized fuses. Uh, so, uh, it's been a while since that one's been out. So, before you plug it in, make sure somebody hasn't done something stupid, like stick a 20 or 30 amp fuse in it. And this has the correct size fuse, so <laughs> thumbs up there. We're off to a good start. It has the rated 4 amp fuse, which is, it's not printed down here, but if you look up at this caution label, it tells you right here, same type, 254... 250 volts, 4. So 4 for 4, and actually down here, yeah, 4 amp, 4A. So just make sure it has the correct fuse in it. Uh, so many times I see radios, they'll have a 6, 8, 10, like I say, it's whatever they happen to have laying around, 20, 30 amp fuse. Well, I'm here to tell you, you go stick in a, or if your radio has a 20 or 30 amp fuse in it, and uh, something seriously wrong, if there, if there is something seriously wrong inside of your radio, uh, it might burst into flames <laughs> long before that fuse blows. So, first thing to check. Again, we're back here. Just take a look at it. Does it look good? Is the antenna connector bent to hell? Because that's a common thing you'll see if radios get shipped and they have not been packaged properly. Uh, it's you know This is one of the few things that sticks out the back. And when a radio gets dropped, these and you know, fuse holders, if they have them on the back, often take a hit. And these will get broken. And what will happen with the antenna connector is the actual back of the chassis will get bent in. Again, it looks fine back here. DC power cord looks fine. There's no extra switches. It, yeah, I wish I had 12 thumbs to show for that. So looks modification free from the back side. Um, while we have it turned around this direction, actually it's a good time to inspect the front. 
Um, and I can see there has been some repair work. And this is actually expected in this radio because this is a common failure point. You can see this resistor bodged on the back of this board. That's actually where Uniden should have put that resistor. They mounted that resistor on the front of the board normally. The problem is this entire area, with this little circuit, there's a, a bunch of other components on the other side here, transistors and diodes, other resistors and capacitor. But what, they, what that is, is the dimmer circuit for the clock. Unfortunately, there's all the push buttons right here, and it, it's just encased. There's no air circulation, and this resistor gets blistering hot. And it's trapped in, in between the faceplate, the circuit board, and then it's surrounded on all four sides, and the heat has nowhere to go. And it cooks the circuit board, it cooks all the components. So, very common to see these radios. Normal illumination will be fine, but when you push the dim button, it's just, it's not dim, it's just not there. <laughs> you won't have any dim. Um, so, obviously, somebody's already worked on this. I'll actually see it. Like I say, I haven't actually powered this up myself yet, so I don't know if the clock even works. Um, but I don't see any of the other parts move to the back here. I usually move more than just the resistor. I actually remove uh, another resistor, and I'll actually usually move uh, the transistor sometimes, or the diode. Uh, it depends on the condition of the circuit traces, because this area gets so hot, it'll actually damage the board sometimes. But uh, so far, so good. You can see we have our nice, as I call it, the protective dirt. <laughs> Which is good. That's a good sign. Somebody has not been in here. Dirt's... People get scared away by dirt. Don't don't let a little bit of dirt scare you. You know, that right there. That's, that's a good sign. It, it's been a long time since somebody's been inside of this radio. And you can see how easily it cleans off. Um, you don't need any cleaners. Um, I highly recommend just not using anything to clean the insides of your radios. If you want to clean it, do what I do. Get a cheap natural bristle brush, something like this, okay? Um, I like using these brushes because if I use them on, when I'm dusting off face plates and whatnot, if you use nylon or plastic bristle brushes, they can scratch the finish sometimes on face plates. Nat natural hair bristle brushes are very soft. Um, so I just use these for everything. I've got different ones. Actually, this one doesn't even say cleaning on it, but I have different ones for different things. This is, just happens to be the one I use for dusting. But really all you need to do this to clean, to clean it out is a dust brush and a vacuum cleaner. So actually, it's underneath the bench, so it's not too horribly loud. But so you can see, and you can just go over the circuit board, work the bristles down into the board. see that that's all that's really needed to clean up one of these radios. So if we look, I get the flashlight again, you can see nice shiny spots there. It's nice and clean. You look over here, it's all dirty, nasty, grimy, still covered, still covered in dust. That's all you really need, just a dust brush and a vacuum cleaner. You could very well use an air compressor too, if you have an air compressor and a blowgun nozzle. Again, I like using the little dust brush the brush, the bristles, because the dust particles will be stuck to all of this stuff in here. But the bristles, if you have nice long bristles like this, you can get down. You can see I just kind of twist them around like that and just gently just break it, breaking, bleh, bleh. <laughs> getting tongue twisted. Basically, all you're doing is breaking the dust loose. And then you can blow it out or suck it out with a vacuum cleaner. That's all you really need. Now, for stuff like metal, you can see there's a little bit of flocking on the the coating here, and you can see if I brush that with my finger, it gets even a little bit shinier. Now you can take a, a rag, uh, something like a microfiber towels actually work great for stuff like this because of all these little millions and millions of little tiny fibers on here are great for trapping dust particles. But don't spray the radio. If you must, just spray a little bit of cleaner, like glass cleaner, onto your rag, and then you can just you can clean it out. So you know, actually, let me just grab some glass cleaner. Spray a little bit on the rag, and then you can clean up the metal parts, you know, top of the transformer, and that's all you really need. 
nice, nice and shiny. It looks really good. Don't need to go saturating the radio with anything. Don't need any harsh chemicals. Don't, don't definitely don't use water. Um, and honestly, some people say, well, you, Mike, you clean the bottoms of the boards to clean the flux off when you're done working on them. You clean it off with isopropyl alcohol. Can I use that on the top? You could, but I still don't recommend it. Any amount of liquid you get up here, you have to remember, even highly refined isopropyl alcohol still has minute traces of water in it. The problem with the main problem with water is it's not that it's not going to dry off of the, the, the board here. It will. It's easy to dry off. The problem is water gets inside of all of these IF transformer coil cans here, okay? There's tiny, tiny, tiny little wires in here. Very rarely will you ever have to change one of these transformers. But if you go soaking a radio with simple green or power blast purple or you know, whatever your favorite cleaner is, or even isopropyl alcohol. Now, the 99.9% .9 stuff, yes, that's about as pure as it's going to get. But this still, there's that 0.1% water in that alcohol that gets in here have to remember the wires and the connections inside these little transformer cans are tiny. They're just miniature, almost microscopic wires in some of these things. The tiniest bit of corrosion, bink, they break right off. And also remember there's capacitors in the bottoms of a lot of these transformer cans. So, yeah, I suggest not using liquids on the top of the boards. The other problem is all this wire. And anyone that's ever been in a flood, or had a vehicle in a flood, um, will know this. Wire acts just like a wick. If you take a foot or two of wire and then take a glass, put about that much water in it, dip the wire in it, and then drape the wire outside of the cup and then set the other end on a paper towel, you come back in a while, the paper towel is going to be wet. That's because water wicks. That's exactly what wire acts like, just like a candle wick. It sucks the water up. It's very it has a very high surface tension, so it just draws itself up in and right out. Next thing you know, that towel soaking wet. Same thing in your radio. You know, it happens in your car in a flood. And you'll, what happens in, in your car is your car works fine until like three, four, or five years later. What happens is the wires just start corroding in half inside of the insulation because the water has wicked its way up inside of this wire and it's now trapped in here. You get some corrosion out towards the ends, it kind of forms a, a plug almost, and it's sealed, and now that water is trapped in there, and your wires start to corrode, and yeah, a few years down the road, you start having all kinds of weird problems. So, liquids, not a good thing. Um, worst case scenario, you get gummy, oily residue sometimes on the board. What I'll do is, I'll, sa I'll, I'll dampen a, my brush like this with some alcohol, and I'll brush it. You know, and, just, and then I'll brush this off on a microfiber towel, redampen it, and I'll just use the brush, but I won't saturate the t actual top of the board. Um, other things, do you see parts? You know, when you're looking, actually, let's get it flipped around in the correct orientation here. You know, probably the next most important thing to look at at the top your power supply circuit, your radio is not going to work if the power supply doesn't work. So obviously check, does the transformer look like it's burned up? Does the wiring look good? Um, this one looks fine, um, other than the thick layer, the positive uh, dust. Can't say I see anything burned up. Um, and people will occasionally ask me when I'm restoring a radio form, uh, should I change the regulator transistors, you know, the driver, the final, the audio amp, the AM regulators? There's all kinds of semiconductors in here. Bridge rectifier. Should they all be replaced? No, absolutely not. Unless there's a problem, you're absolutely wasting your money. <laughs> uh, you know, those transistors could just as easily hum along for another 40 or 50 years or longer. As long as they haven't, you know, this radio hasn't been, and it doesn't look like it, just from first appearances, none of the trimmers are cranked to full rotation, which we'll get to in a minute, but it looks like it's factory. Wax, still in the core. Wax, still in the core. Wax, still in the core. There's never been anybody in this radio, so it was set to factory levels, which is where it will be at when I, I'm done with it. These transistors will last for decades, and they'll work just fine. So, yeah, it's an absolute waste of money replacing semiconductors, um, the only thing you need to replace inside of anything, and it's not just CB radios, anything that plugs into a wall or runs off of batteries, 
um, that has any type of circuit to it other than maybe a flashlight has electrolytic capacitors. They just go bad. They go bad with time. If you go to any electrolytic capacitor manufacturer's website, um, you can pull up the data sheet for electro aluminum electrolytic capacitors and you'll see they have a lifespan. They have a listed lifespan. This is their expected lifespan. After that, they're not, they're not reliable anymore. That's because they go bad. The oils inside dry up. The aluminum starts to oxidize. It starts to po puncture through the dielectric paper that's insulating the two layers of aluminum foil in there. And you start the oxides, as it punches through, starts to short the two plates out together. Um, and eventually, usually small ones won't explode, but larger ones, eventually they can just pop. They'll, they get so hot because the, the capacitors basically turn into a resistor over time. The ESR, or equivalent series resistance, starts to rise as that capacitor gets older. The capacitor is basically turning from a capacitor into a resistor, and eventually they just pop. But yeah, that's the one thing that does go bad. It's just a, it's kind of like uh, rubber tires on your car. Park your car outside, never drive your car anywhere. Just let it sit. Come back in 30 years, guess what? You need a new set of tires. That's because the rubber has deteriorated. Capacitor is kind of the same thing. Just And actually, that's the worst thing you can do to an electrolytic capacitor, not use it. Um, just the simple fact of, uh, because a radio, let's say you have a new old stock radio, actually this dusty radio here actually has a better chance of capacitors still being in decent condition than you do in a new old stock never used radio. Um, actually, the process of turning on electronic devices like this and powering up electrolytic capacitors actually helps to prevent that from happening. They actually reform every time you turn it on. Those oxides can help start to get absorbed back into the metal. It's a, it's a very complicated electrochemical reaction that actually happens inside of an electrolytic capacitor. But yeah, actually just not using them is the worst thing you can do. Um, so again, we're going to keep looking here. Like I say, power supply looks good, so the only thing we really need to do here is... Now, the, there is one thing. Yes, the semiconductors themselves may be fine, you know, all of them around here, but you have all of these components mounted to heat sinks, and you have a heat sink tab on the bridge rectifier. Now, of course, unfortunately, in the case of the bridge rectifier here, the screw comes up from the bottom, so you do have to desolder the bridge rectifier to get the screw out. But I highly recommend applying new heat sink a compound to all of the transistors, or in most cases, uh, for radios like this, I'll actually switch over, I'm actually turning around to grab one, to sill pads, modern pads. These take nothing. You don't, you don't use any uh, heat transfer grease on these. This is the, the heat transfer. It's an insulator and a heat transfer agent. So you just clean off everything. Now, on the finals here, don't do that. You know, other components, voltage regulators and stuff like that, yes. But the finals, if they have a mica wafer, like you see on these other transistors, a little thin, kind of clear-looking mica wafer, like over here on this transistor over here, yes, you can replace them with these. But if the, like this radio, they actually have a uh, ceramic, uh, so it's a thick, white, hard insulator there. They actually use those for a little bit of RF decoupling between the, the uh, chassis ground and the transistor. So if they have those ceramic ones, I suggest you just leave those, I mean, Still take them out, clean them up, apply new heat transfer compound, but just reuse those uh, those ceramic insulators. Um, again, another thing you're going to want to look for, now like I said, I can pretty much tell nothing's ever been done because that's the first giveaway. The VCO voltage has never been adjusted. The last adjustment for the final transistor and the 54 megahertz trap coil have never been adjusted since this thing left the factory. So, yeah, I'm really not concerned about looking for modifications. Um, and another thing, usually if somebody's been in here with their golden screwdriver, you'll see a lot of these little trimmer resistors. So, like that little guy right there, you've got ones to adjust your bias. But if you start to see some of those, they're turned at full rotation, one direction or the other, Yes, there's probably been a golden screwdriver in your radio. This one, again, they're all somewhere, you know, mid-rotation. So, looks factory. Uh, there's no parts clipped. There's no holes that, you know, have just a lead sticking out where you can see somebody whacked a transistor, a diode, or a resistor off. So, things are looking really good on the top side here. Um, honestly, really, really good. And, and you can see how nice it cleaned up here. 
a little bit more clean and man this thing will look like brand new on the inside uh, now when you do do this honestly it's the same with this radio cobra 2000s any of the radios that had this really large heat sink plate in the back of them the easiest way to apply new heat transfer grease and if you're using the thermo pads like i do to use those uh, the easiest thing to do is just remove this plate so just remove the screws off of everything um, same thing over here now these will actually have nylon screws they're plastic screws on these two ic's right here uh, i usually put new ones in um, i understand if you're doing this on your own um, you're just an operator not a tech you might not have new ones uh, as long as the old ones you put them back in if, if they hold and don't go over tightening them because they're pla that's the big they're plastic <laughs> they can't take a lot of stress it just needs to be enough when you put heat sink compound in there when you tighten that up just enough to get the squeeze out as soon as you feel it get snug stop don't crank down on it like a metal screw and even these honestly if you go cranking down on screws here you're just going to strip the threads out of this aluminum plate but the easiest thing to do is just take all the screws out and then there's a couple screws there's two down here and three along the back side just take the three screws out for the entire plate and just lift the whole plate out then you can get out some glass cleaner clean the plate off really good you can easily get in here with a towel then and clean the back sides of all those integrated circuits you know the ic's here and the transistors off and and then reinstall it and put everything back in but yeah look it's looking really good on the top now this does have a uh, corrosive glue again that's one of those things pretty much any radio is going to have um so you should remove that now it does not look like it's gotten to the point where it's trying to eat this radio from the inside out and that's mainly uh, from what i've been able to tell how a radio has been used in other words just how hot it's gotten so it's more of an environment uh, the environment that a radio was in how hot it got and humidity really seems to affect how this glue kind of get down there if you can even see that stuff you can see that goop on this capacitor to that crystal over. They pour it around large, big things, like the uh, large capacitors will have it. They'll usually have some on the crystals because they're, you know, they're kind of, you can see they kind of move around a little bit. So they always pour that stuff on there. The problem is that stuff gets can get down underneath of the component like the crystals, and it'll eat the leads off of it. Same thing with the uh, PLL chip. A lot of times, now luckily it didn't get over this far, but in a lot of these radios, these back two pins right here, it's actually not uncommon to see. They're just gone. They've just been eaten off because that glue had oozed over here and touched those two leads. And as it becomes corrosive, it just eats the leads off of But yeah, this stuff looks like it's still kind of juicy and rubbery. It's not dried out. It's not hard. So yes, now's the time to get it out. So, you know, there'll be some there. There's some over... There's some you can see right there on this one from this ceramic capacitor here up to the crystal. But again, luckily, whoever installed the glue in this one used it sparingly. They didn't get out the five-gallon bucket and saturate the radio. So, yeah, there's some around a little coupling transformer here. Anything that has a ferrite bead on it will have some of that glue. All of the crystals are always going to have a dot of that glue on there. Usually some right here. But uh, just clean that off. Um, now... Stuff like this, this little coupling transformer, should you get the glue off? Yes, but you need to be careful. And it's not uncommon. If you just touch this little coupling transformer, don't be surprised the lead, the wires just break off. There are tiny little wires on this, so there's actually two wires wrapped on that coil. Don't be surprised if they're just broken off. Uh, you, you touch it. You just barely touch the thing, and bink, one of them snaps off. That's common. That's to be expected. They poured glue on it. Now, if the glue has not actually gotten down to the circuit board and isn't touching the exposed part of those wires, it's just fine. Usually, they'll be fine. You can pull it off, you know, the stuff that's in between this cap and that coil, but that glue that's actually touching the top side here, you're actually better off just leaving it there. You have to remember, this, this wire is a uh, magnet wire. So, it's... Uh, it is enamel coated uh, so the glue is not actually touching bare wire it's actually touching the enamel the only place these wires are actually exposed or where they actually go through the board the enamel wire coating is removed so the component can then be soldered to the circuit board so yeah if it's not down to the board you're probably fine if it is down to the board don't be surprised you just breathe on that little critter it's just gonna blink it's just gonna pop off now 
don't panic. They're easy to rewind. There's no need to replace it. The, the, the ferrite core itself is still fine. Just, re, just make sure you use the same diameter uh, enamel wire. You can rewind it. They're, it's really simple to rewind coupling transformers like that. Um, so I think that's about it. Um, now, if you're going to recap your radio, uh, you don't need to use anything else. Just use a good brand name general purpose capacitor. Um, there's no need to spend vast amounts of money on super capacitors. Um, that, you have to remember, this is a CB radio. This is not a thousand, five thousand, or ten thousand dollar high-end stereo receiver. Uh, trust me, this is about as low fidelity as electronics gets. <laughs> as much as people may not want to hear that, they think, oh, my, my CB radio is hi-fi. Trust me. I don't care how much work. You could do a thousand dollars of work to this radio. It's never going to be hi-fi. For starters, it's AM. It's monaural. <laughs> it's mono. It, there's no stereo here. This, this is about as high fidelity as my left foot. <laughs> so, dumping vast amounts of money into expensive electrolytic capacitors is just a waste of money. Just use something like Nichicon, Panasonic, Rubicon, Use their good 105 degree C temperature rated uh, general purpose capacitors. They're perfectly fine for this. Um, I occasionally also get people ask me, well, what about audio capacitors? That falls into that high dollar capacitor category. Honestly, audio capacitors in something like this, waste of money. Are they better? Yes. Now, that's an argument to be had in another post, probably. <laughs> audio capacitors. Do audio capacitors make a difference? Yes, they do. Now, I work on uh, guitar amplifiers, stereo systems as well. In equipment like that, yes, in very, very high-end electronics, actually, stereo receivers are a good example. I can take the cover off of a Kenwood or a Pioneer. Uh, and, you know, I'm recapping a vintage, let's say, 1980s Pioneer Kenwood, or even some, you know, something older, an old, older equipment, something from Macintosh. You'll very frequently in those radio or in those receivers, you'll see like maybe three capacitors in the entire radio you know, in the entire receiver. There may be a hundred capacitors in it. There'll be two or three. They'll be they look different than the rest of them. And when you remove them, you'll see they actually say audio on them. That's because they're a high-end manufacturer. They knew that when they designed that radio in those one, two, or three critical areas, using an audio capacitor did make a difference. If it would have made a difference anywhere else, they would have used it there. Because we're not talking cheap electronics like a CB radio. We're talking, you know, no expense spared high fidelity stereos. So even in ultra premium equipment, they only ever used maybe two or three audio capacitors. They really don't make a difference anywhere else. And trust me, like I say, in something as low fidelity as a CB radio, you could use capacitors that cost $500 a piece put them in here, you'll never notice a difference. This thing, it's a CB radio, they're noisy to start with, like I say, it's mono, there is no high fidelity, it's, you're never going to notice the difference, so save your money. Just buy good capacitors. If you get good Nichicon or Panasonic capacitors, they're good general purpose, 105 degree C caps, trust me, they're going to be a lot better than what was used in this radio from the factory. Now, they didn't use cheap junk in these, the absolute cheapest thing on the planet, but trust me, these are fairly cheap caps. So, just upgrading to a good general-purpose modern electrolytic, you're doing your radio a world of, of good right there. And they'll last longer than what was in here to start with, because those are a better capacitor, the, the modern, higher-end, like I say, general-purpose caps. You just don't need those specialty caps. You'll never notice a difference in a radio like this. So, like I say... Everything looked good here. I'm really happy to see that, yeah, this is going to be a e very easy job. Take out the heat sinks, some new heat transfer compound, and sill pads, a uh, little bit of cleaning, remove the corrosive glue, replace the electrolytic capacitors, transceiver alignment, and, be, and I do need to pull this display board out of the front here. And uh, we haven't powered it up yet, and we still haven't powered it up yet because we haven't turned it over and inspected the bottom side. So let's do that now. And things are looking good on the bottom side. Again, it does not look like 
the local butcher shop butcher got fired and tried to become a CB radio tech because I don't see any butchering here. Uh, now don't be surprised if you see components occasionally hanging off of the circuit board. Very common for manufacturers to do stuff like that, you know, like ground wires. They've got ground, they might have had a ground loop and they'll add wires. Um, sometimes a component, it's just easier to add a component on the bottom side of the board than it is on the top. So yeah, don't be surprised. Kind of the easy way to tell is look at the solder connections for everything else. If the solder connection here look about the same, they don't look new and you don't see a bunch of blobbed up flux. You know, if there's blobbed up flux around a component and there's not anywhere else on the board, yes, somebody else may have added that at some later time. But if it has the clear plastic tubing like this, it's a little sticky because it's old. Yeah, it's original. It, it's was it, you know, same thing with the resistor. Uh, this is a, you know, looks like exactly the same type resistor used on the other side of this board. It has the painted lead. So it was meant to be mounted on a circuit board standing up like that. Usually if somebody's going to be adding a resistor to the bottom side of the board after the fact, it's going to be one like this. It does not have painted leads on one side or the other. So yeah, original um, power supply input looks, well, actually I was going to say it looks fine here, but what is that little piece of metal right there? I don't know if you can see that or not. There's a little, yeah, there's actually a strand of the wire. Oh, it actually it's a blob of solder. Yeah, so need to get that little guy. I don't like having uh, pieces of wire or anything hanging off because that's the power cord. It comes into the radio. So yeah, everything looks fine here. So this looks like a, oh, for once, an easy job. <laughs> but now now that we've verified everything looks good, power, the power connections, wiring, everything looks good on the underside here. Um, you know, from the DC jack, the chokes look fine. Nothing looks hacked. Now it's safe to plug it in. Now, if you're a radio tech, you're yeah, hoping you have a isolation transformer to start with. I realize if you're just a home hobbyist, you probably don't have one. Um, if you plan on working on a lot of your own radios, I'd probably recommend getting an isolation transformer. Save you from killing yourself or getting at least one heck of a nasty shock. But uh, I use an isolated variable power supply right there. Um, but the whole idea behind that is when I plug this in, it's transformer decoupled from the AC mains. So I can literally plug this in and touch the 120 volt wire in here. As long as I don't touch the up now, you still have to remember, you still have to practice safety. If you touch both both wires, basically, if I plug this into the isolation transformer, if I only touch one wire, I'm still fine. I can touch a ground, you know, a coax cable that's attached to an earth ground. I don't have to worry about getting electrocuted because the 120 volts coming out of that isolation transformer, it's just that it's isolated from ground. But if you touch both wires coming out, yes, you're still going to be touching 120 volts. <laughs> So, let me plug that in, turn that on, and let's see here. So, we have blinky clock, that's a good sign. And turn it on, got channel display, looking good there. Mode lights work. Uh, let's see, dim, ah, aha, <laughs> so it doesn't work. So yeah, somebody fixed it, but it's still not working right. So you can see the dimmer circuit's still not working. The bright works, actually, let's stop that thing from flashing. Um, it's fine on bright, but yeah, when you go to dim, it's completely dead. So yeah, that's, that. the transistor or diode actually probably got cooked on that circuit board. So yeah, I definitely have to take that out and take a look at it now. So everything looks good so far. Um, there's no smoke coming out of the radio. No smoke is always a good thing. Um, now another thing, if you have something like this, which is actually a, an isolated variable power supply, it actually has a built-in amp meter as well. Um, nice thing, would, if you have something like this, then you can actually monitor the current draw. So if you turn the radio on and you see the needle go up way too high, um, you could quickly turn it off. You know, you can easily catch it before you start to let out the magic smoke. So, we're looking good so far, so let's hook up a speaker. Should be, I think, the second jack back here. And we'll hook up the communications test set. And we need a 
microphone that plugged in. Okay, and I hear static. Uh, let's see, I got the communications test set on channel 19. Well, I hear sound. Yeah. Controls are. Yeah, it's. <laughs> the controls are basically coated with that fine dust. So, yeah, all the controls, I'm sure, are completely crusty. Yeah, you can hear that. Yeah, that's it's doing that because the controls are so dirty. So, receive actually is working really well. Um, I'm putting in a really low signal level. Have not adjusted anything yet. Lower sideband seems to be off a lot more than so upper. Yeah, running out of clarifier there. So, yeah, I think the crystals seem to be, they're closed. It's its off frequency, but it's its close. So, don't think any of the crystals will need to be replaced. Um, let's try transmit. So, look over at the communications test set. There's the watt meter at the bottom. I'm going to turn the mic gain down the whole way first. NAM. Got 3.65 watts. So, let me turn the mic gain up. And I'll just whistle into the microphone. It's doing around 13 to 14 watts AM. Sideband. About 12 and a half watts on sideband, so it works. <laughs> it's alive. So, yeah, I think this one will be actually a fairly fairly easy job to do. Um, doesn't really need much. I mean, the normal cap job cleanup and just the normal thing you'd expect to do with anything over 30 years old. Uh, but, yeah, this looks like the customer got a winner. You know, winner, winner, chicken dinner. <laughs> so, yeah, there's a, just a few of the steps to go through. I, I highly recommend on CB radios. Like I say, they're kind of the exception to the rule of electronics. Um, they're just known for being so hacked at, you really need to check just to make sure if it's safe to plug in first. And you're never going to tell if it's safe to plug in first, but if you, unless you take the covers off and, and inspect things a little bit. You don't need to know everything there is to know about electronics. Just, a, just common sense. If something doesn't look right, it's probably not. <laughs> so, you know, bare wiring, stuff that's burned up, uh, you know, parts hanging off of boards. Yeah, obvious. You know, it's you know, if it looks like somebody hacked at something, they probably did. You may want to get a tech, a local tech, you know, whoever you happen to use, it doesn't matter, but at least have them take a look at it before you power it up because the last thing you want to do is is power up your radio only to find out that some nitwit to crank the power up on the power supply board and it's putting out 15, 16, 17 volts because that's another common, and that's not even a modification, that's just a screwdriver, that's part of that golden screwdriver job. They'll crank the, uh, a lot of these power supplies are adjustable. Um, it should be set at 13.8 volts. You look at every service manual, they're going to tell you 13.8 volts. Not 14, not 15, not 16, 17, 18, or 20 volts, 13.8. That's what it's supposed to run at. If you go turning the power up on this thing, especially if you turn it up, you know, to like 15 and a half or 16 volts, you have to remember a lot of times the electrolytic capacitors that are in this radio, they're rated at 16 volts. So if you go putting 16 volts on a capacitor and there's any ripple voltage getting out of this power supply into this part of the radio, that ripple voltage is going to be exceeding the voltage rating of the cap. So yes, then you're going to damage electrolytic capacitors. You're going to be overpowering transistors. You're going to be overpowering the other regulators. You're going to be overpowering your audio amp. And I see so many radios. That's all. That's the only thing that was done. They won't adjust anything else. People just take the cover off, crank the voltage up the whole way to get more power out of it, and then years later, you know, somebody, some other poor unfortunate fool buys the radio and it needs a driver, it needs a final transistor, the, the audio, I just did one here a few weeks ago, can't remember what model radio that was, but the driver and final was bad, they were low, um, the audio amp was dead shorted, uh, 
one of the capacitors in the thing was getting so hot it was about ready to burst. It had all kinds of problems, all because somebody cranked the voltage up the whole way. The alignment procedures have very specific, uh, it's laid out very specifically, and the first thing you check is the power supply voltage. Adjust that correctly, do all of your other adjustments if you're going to do your own alignments. A doom is doom just like the factory told you. When you're done, you'll have a very good working radio that will, you know, done properly can last you for decades to come. With all of its original semiconductors, like I say, there's no need to go change them. Now, if the voltage, if the power supply voltage had been cranked up on it, don't be surprised if there are a bunch of bad semiconductors. But, even if it was, if the power supply voltage was cranked up, as long as they still work, once you get done, you know, restoring your radio, setting the power supply voltage properly, as long as they're still working properly, your driver and final transistors are still putting out good power, you still have good modulation, the audio is still fine, there's no need to change those, those semiconductors. They're still probably fine. Yes, they've probably been stressed a little bit, but they're still working and will still probably work for decades to come. So, you know, save, save yourself money. Usually you, you don't need a lot of work in a radio like this. Um, and even if they have, like I say, a lot of times you may have to add, spend a little bit of money replacing a few parts if somebody's, you know, butchered at it for a while. But when you're done, you'll have a really nice working radio. So, like I say, there's just a few tips on, uh, you know, things to look for when you get a new radio, things to look for, especially before you power it up. Um, just some simple little things, how to clean, what maintenance you should do, um, things you can just, you can waste tons of money on a radio, but you don't need to, because like I always try and tell people, the majority of that money you're going to waste on a radio is just that, it's a waste. It, you'll never gain any benefit on something like a CB radio. You know, if we were working on a $5,000 Pioneer top-end stereo receiver, yes, some of, the, some of that stuff, it's very critical, the, you know, the specifications for the components you use in it. But the majority of the stuff in this radio, honestly, it couldn't care less, and it's not going to make a bit of difference, because it was not designed to be high fidelity to start with. So, like I say, I hope maybe some of those little pointers uh, might help somebody out down the road, uh, hopefully help, help you prevent letting the magic smoke out of your radio, so you don't have to send it to somebody like me. Um, and... Hopefully that keep keep your radio going for a few more decades. <laughs> so there you go. There's a and I'll probably do another a separate video on this to show just to show this radio once I get done with it. Um, that you know the dimmer circuit's been fixed and you'll see. So you know if you keep an eye out probably in the same time frame whenever this video gets uploaded, um, I'll do a, a separate one like I say to show the work that was done to it and that it works fine and do some receiver sensitivity test. And actually, now that I think about it, I don't think the meters work. I wasn't actually looking at them. I don't. I think I glanced down. Put her in AM here. And it would help if I turned it on first, wouldn't it? Ah, me the needles. Yeah, I actually unkeyed. The needles are sticking. So again, here's another thing. Save yourself some money. So you can see. Uh, camera back a little bit, unplug the mic, turn the radio off. That needle's not moving. You do not need to replace these meters. Um, some time ago, I did a separate video on how, titled something, How to Unstick Your Meter Needles. Go watch that video. It's very simple. Pretty much anybody can do it. It's just a matter of taking the meter out of the radio, popping the plastic lens loose as just some cellophane or you know, scotch tape on either side of the meter to hold the lens on. Take that off with a little bit of, uh, I use a radio TV rep repairman's solvent, but uh, just nail polish remover, acetone works fine. Just one little tiny dot of acetone on the little set screws on either side there. You back them off about a quarter turn, those need needles will free up and they'll work fine. It's just the, the meters are old, over the last 30 plus years, the housings have twisted a little bit. Things start to bind up. You just readjust those set screws. Like I say, don't back, don't unscrew the darn thing because you'll destroy your meter. Just back them out an eighth to a quarter turn. You, you should be able to then touch that needle and it should flick. You should see it be able to just kind of rebound. If you 
take the needle over to here and you let go of it, it should drop back down and bounce and actually bounce a few times. Once you get it to that point, it's fine. Put the lens back on, two pieces of scotch tape, put it back in your radio, solder the two wires back on, and your meters will last you for another 30 or 40 years. Just fine. Yeah, there's no need to replace meters because the needles are stuck. Um, now, if the meter movements are burned out, yes. But stuck needles are very, very easily fixed. So, you know, you can go watch that video. I did uh, two meters. I, have, I don't even remember what the heck radio those meters were out of. may have been a Cobra 2000. But, uh, yeah, it's a very simple process. Anybody with a, with a screwdriver and a, uh, a tiny amount of acetone can easily fix those. So, anyhow, there's a few tips. I hope that helps somebody out. Actually, I thought I'd tack a little piece onto this video after I got, got this far. So this, if you want to clean it out, this is how it, the easiest way to do it. Four solder connections. You can remove the bridge rectifier. When you get the bridge rectifier out, then you can get the screw out of the transistor and take the heat sink out. Same thing along the back. Took all the screws out of all the semiconductors and then take the five screws that hold down those two plates. So now it's very easy. You can see I haven't cleaned these off yet. It's very easy to get all the heat sink compound off. Um, install new... Uh, the new thermal pads, the little sill pads, instead of using uh, these mica wafers, so then you'll never ever have to worry about applying heat sink compound again. Like I say, the one exception there is on the driver and final transistors, just reuse the original ceramic ones, because like I say, they... And that's kind of an up-in-the-air question. I know people have argued over the, the need for those, uh, about the RF decoupling between the chassis ground and those transistors. Some people just, and in some radios, they don't use those. They use mica wafers. So they went to the expense of using them. I'm going to just stick them back in because there's nothing wrong with them. But like I say, the other ones I'll just install sill pads. But like I say, once you get those out, it's very easy to get you know, full access to clean out the radio. And you can see with nothing more than a vacuum cleaner, a cheap natural bristle paintbrush, and a little bit of elbow grease, it cleans up really, really nice. Nice and shiny. Uh, there are a few little spots. Now, you have to remember, these chassis are actually plated. This is not, you know, bare steel. There's actually a plating on here. And you occasionally get what I call flocking. These little, you see little tiny spots. So that's actually, it's oxidized through down to the base uh, steel. Um, now, to prevent that from happening any farther, now, if you want to try and get rid of some of that, um, just rubbing it with you know a, a microfiber towel and glass cleaner is not going to do anything for that. But you can use a, a metal polish. And what I like uh, now, buddy over at the radio shop, he uses. He's a Never Doll fan, and I've I've got too many miles behind that. <laughs> when I was in the army polishing brass, but I use this stuff. It's still basically the same thing. Basically, cotton that's been impregnated with a uh, you know a cleaning compound. But uh, you know, I get this is called what extreme metal polish used to actually be called water years and years ago. It was actually spelled, I think, O-U-T-E-R. Um, it was like a German or Swiss company or something, and they sold out to some other company. But anyhow, this stuff's actually made in the USA here nowadays. Um, this is great for cleaning off that, that surface oxidation and then to prevent that from happening any farther. Um, of course, a lot of you probably know I'm a gun nut, <laughs> so have boatloads of guns. I've got several gun vaults. I've got so many. But I spend a lot of time cleaning my guns. And gun cleaning products, the oils, they're good for one thing. It's one thing they really tout with uh, weapons oils is corrosion resistance. Because the last thing you want to do is, and the last thing I want to do is, is take one of my like eight, nine, or ten thousand dollar high-end uh, target rifles and stick it in a vault and come back, and years later it's got a bunch of pits in the in the bluing. So yes, something you can apply. Again, fairly easy to get. It doesn't have to be this, but this comes in a spray can. But something like REM oil. Um, again, just grab your microfiber towel. You know, just don't need a lot. Just a quick little shot. But what you want to do is, is just apply a very thin coat of that. The idea being that stuff actually has corrosion inhibitors. So you don't want oil dripping out of your radius. That's why I say just lightly dampen the towel and then just wipe down the exposed steel parts of the chassis and that will apply a, a protective coating to it so that corrosion doesn't progress anymore. It'll stop it from happening. So 
and that's it. Like I say, it, nothing hard. It's very simple to do. Uh, you know, honestly, you don't really have to do that. Like I say, that's just if you're getting anal, and yes, I get, I tend to be anal about stuff. So yeah, you know, a little bit extra steps, but that's all that's needed. Yeah, just a dust brush and a vacuum cleaner is really all you need. If you really want to get crazy, you can get out a little bit of polish to try and get rid of a little bit of the flocking, try and you know, knock that oxidation down, and then just a really, really light coat of uh, some type of protective gun oil, and you'll prevent that the oxidation from spreading or popping up anywhere else on the chassis over the years. So there you go. I'll just uh, I'll finish it there. I thought, like I say, I thought once I got all this stuff out and actually got it cleaned up, I'd show it. But you had seen it before. Yeah, it was com it was just nasty looking. That didn't take long. Very, very little amount of time to get it get it to this point. Now I just got to clean these up, put them back in, and then I can recap the radio and uh, be ready to go. So there you go.